I speak to you in the name of one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please. You know, I just can't get that scene from the book of Acts that we just read, just can't get it out of my head. Picture it, the disciples standing around, watching Jesus' feet slowly float up to the clouds, and then, poof, he's gone. And the disciples are left to linger in the places where Jesus used to be. How lonely must they have felt? As a number of you know, a few weeks ago, I had the chance to go back to my old seminary in Alexandria, Virginia, where Timothy Rutherford and I graduated just a year ago, and a lot has changed up there even in one year. So maybe that's why I had a dream this last week of going to seminary, and while I was there not recognizing a single person in my dream, and then finding that all of the familiar places had all changed. You know how dreams do that. By the way, I woke up feeling so glad to be here and not there. So thank you. But that's, I think, more than just my subconscious working stuff out in my dream. Haven't we all felt that way? Have you ever driven by your old childhood home? Have you ever drifted like a ghost down the hallways of your high school? or down the streets of the city where you used to live, wondering where it all went. Every time Christian and I go to Sarasota, she's like, that wasn't there before. That used to be here and isn't there anymore. Do you know what that's like? And it's graduation season, too. So with the stroke of a pen and a diploma and a cap and a gown, all of that pomp and circumstance is done. And even if you could go back, it wouldn't be the same. Because at least, most, at least most of the most important people would be gone. It's probably like that for the disciples. Can you imagine being where Jesus used to be? In fact, some biblical historians suggest that the stations of the cross, which you see framed around the room, that those stations in some way became, were invented because as the story has it, the Blessed Virgin Mary would get up every morning and she would go and visit each of the places in Jerusalem that were significant to where her son suffered for us. It must have felt to them like God was just gone. And doesn't it feel like God is gone to us sometimes? like it maybe isn't all real, like it's all just wishful thinking. You ever feel like your prayers bounce off the ceiling, aren't, aren't ever delivered somewhere? It's like waiting on that email that never gets sent because you sent it to the wrong address. Well, to be honest, it feels like that to me sometimes, like it's all just wishful thinking. Like, but Frederick Beekner, the Presbyterian minister and author has a word of comfort for us. When we feel that way, this is what he says. He says, God is never gone. It's just people go blind. I have some good news for you, especially if you feel that way sometimes. The ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. After 40 days, he ascended into the clouds to go to heaven. We celebrated that day last Thursday. We've read about that ascension today. The ascension ironically means that God is never gone, even though Jesus has gone to heaven. Because the ascension means that Jesus went to heaven, went to his Holy Father in order to prepare a place for us in his Father's house and to pray for us. And it also means that Jesus ascended to heaven so that he could send the Holy Spirit Another comforter, just like myself, he said, that Holy Spirit sent to us. And that Holy Spirit is the deposit of the promise. It's the down payment that Jesus will live in us forever. The disciples asked about the kingdom. They wanted a fortress. Hey, are you going to bring your kingdom now? It's the question they've been asking for the last year. Are you going to bring your kingdom? Are you going to bring your kingdom? And he said, that's none of your business. 
but I will send the Holy Spirit to you. They wanted a castle. But what the Lord wanted in each of us was a temple for his Holy Spirit, and he sent it to us after ascension. I read a meme this week from a fellow priest that said, Ascension Day is when Jesus started working from home. (laughs) And it's true. The home that he is preparing for us, and he's working from home through his Holy Spirit living in us. That work, that work of the Holy Spirit helps us to look up to see that God is never gone. In the verse right before the gospel passage that Deacon Tim read, we find Jesus telling his disciples just before his crucifixion this. Right before this passage, he said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. For I have overcome the world. And he was right. How many of us know about trouble in this world? But what does our liturgy say right in the middle of the Eucharistic service? Right in the middle of our troubles, right in the middle of our lives. I'm warning you, this is the audience participation participation part. Let's see if you can do better than the eight o'clock. This is what Jesus says to us when we are in the middle of our troubles. Lift up your hearts. Well, the choir passes. Let's try again. The liturgy says, lift up your hearts. The, The liturgy doesn't say, feel better about things. I can't do that but I can lift up my heart as an act of the will. And when we get to that part in the liturgy, I want to hear it today. We can. We can lift up our hearts because he has overcome the world. We can do that all day long because the Holy Spirit with us means that Jesus is living inside of us. And he is doing that in order to restore us, as St. Peter said, to make us strong, to make us firm, and to make us steadfast, even when, especially when, we can't see him anywhere and we, like the disciples, feel like God is gone. When it feels that way, we should look up from our trouble. The disciples must have done that for the rest of their lives, looking up to see if Jesus was coming back. I don't, know if it, I don't know about you, but if it were me and I were a disciple, I would take the long way home and go past the Mount of Olives every day from lunch or whatever just to see if he was coming back the same way that he left. The expectation was that Jesus was going to come back within their lifetimes, and that's a good expectation for us. In the collect that I prayed this morning, that we all prayed together at the beginning of the service, here's what we beg God. We say, do not leave us comfortless in this troublesome world, but send your Holy Spirit. And that's what Ascension Day means. And God will answer us in the day of every trouble we face and will comfort us with his very presence. A dear friend of mine, actually, assures me that this is true. I don't know how you would have responded to these circumstances. I wouldn't have responded like she did. After a lifetime of faithful service to the Lord, her husband, a pastor and a chaplain, in his retirement drowned in a fishing accident while he was trying to save the other guys in the boat with him. This was just a few years ago. And how my friend cried out to God for comfort and for the presence of the Holy Spirit in her, where just in the retirement years, her husband was taken away. And God did come to her, and she took heart in the one who overcame the world. A few years after that, she was alone in her house where her husband used to live, and she took a fall, hit her head on the table, And she lay on the floor for 26 hours until somebody came to help her. How would you react? 
I know how I would react. And much of this world would say, yeah, I thought God was good, but then he took my husband and then he left me there sitting there. How could a good God allow things to happen? I spent my whole life in service to him. Don't you hear those kinds of complaints all the time? How did you survive? I asked my friend. She said, oh, I just prayed and prayed and prayed. And then I recited every scripture that I could remember. And then I sang every hymn and song of praise that I knew. And I did it again. And you know what, Andrew? The Lord was there with me every hour. She looked up. She looked up to the one who loves us. She looked up to the one who defends the widows, which is what our psalm said. This is not optimism. This is not self-hypnosis to get in a better mood. This is not even her faith. You hear it all the time. Well, my faith keeps me going. My faith doesn't keep me going very far. My faith barely gets my shoes on in the morning. It's not my faith. But it's in the one in whom I have a mustard seed of faith. It's not about me conjuring faith that things are going to work out all right. It's God descending on me, bringing comfort and answering every promise. The comforter was with her every hour. She looked to the one who loves us. And he was there for her. And God raised her up just like he saves and raises us in all of our troubles. St. Peter, at the end of a long life, full of trouble, pleads with us this way. This is what he urges us to do. He says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand so that he may lift us up in due time. Not my timing, but in his. And he encourages us, encourages us to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. Just like my friend, just like so many faithful people, just like so many of you whose stories I know, Peter knew about the fiery ordeal that comes to test us. You know people like that. In fact, many of you are people like that. Because of the presence of God inside of us, we can all be people like that. And we can trust in the promise by his ascension and sending the Holy Spirit that he will come back and claim us for his own. Someday, maybe, hopefully, before the next election, before the end of this coming week. Maybe, please God, even so, come Lord Jesus before the end of the sermon. Today, this week, wherever we find ourselves, by the power of the Holy Spirit inside us, let us humble ourselves. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us look up. Let us put others first, believing in the God who saves us and casting all of our cares on him. And because Jesus is returning just like he left, let's keep looking up to the skies. Let's keep our glance towards heaven, hoping that today is the day that he returns. And while we're looking up, Let us move forward. Let us make our lives like a cross. Let us go to Jerusalem and Judea and the ends of the world. Let's go to everyone who needs a good word. Let us keep busy doing the good work of loving God and loving our neighbors, even as we cast every care on him. And let us today, this week, deliberately, by the power of the Holy Spirit, look Amen.